Hello everybody, this is True Demon, the Devil Stockbroker, and uh, this is an update on some of our squeeze picks that we have uh, and some of our diamond plays at Hell's Trading Floor. First up is Progenity. Um, there's been a little bit of selling pressure on Progenity for the last several trading days that's got people a little bit upset, and for whatever reason there's this circulating rumor that I sold my position. I have not. <laughs> I've not sold a single share. I'm still here, um, and nothing has changed with my position. Right now Progenity is uh, currently testing its support levels at $1.60, um, which I feel like it held up fairly well. This is exactly um, where uh, our previous resistance was that we had finally cracked through back on the uh, 8th of February and uh, after three tests of it. So uh, what I'm looking for is for Progenity to make a bounce here and get back on trend. This is probably just a you know fake out breakdown. It's kind of exacerbated by the market overall, like because Russia decided to go and piss on the entire U.S. market um, just by dragging us into their shit with the Ukraine. But um, hopefully if Putin can behave himself, then maybe we won't have to be dealing with uh, World War III and we can get back to having a good time. But the uh, for right now, most biotech and ETFs are down. Uh, so Progenity is also down. It honestly didn't break down all that much than what I expected it to. Like just since the Ukraine incident, we've retraced about 14% mm, over the last trading week. So it's not good, but it's still holding up. So I'm really not all that worried. The uh, five-day EMA is still flattening out. So I'm guessing that we're going to start making a bit of a curl back toward the uh, north end of things. The volume is still pretty low. The OBB is slowly making its way back up, but the last four trading days have dragged us down a little bit. Overall, the volume is still pretty low at the moment. Um, latest news for Progenity is the Belgian conference, which from what I hear went fairly well. It was mostly just discussing their um, uh, products with their preeclampsia rule out test that is precludia and uh, you've heard me speak about that pretty frequently but just as a recap that's a product for testing and ruling out pregnant mothers for preeclampsia which is the second leading cause of death for uh for pregnant mothers and um this rule out test would allow doctors to prepare and catch that kind of uh risk condition for mothers several months in advance of their expected delivery date. Um, that's currently a $3 billion market. So there's a huge opportunity for Progenity to capture some of that, that even if they got 1% of it, then they would literally be increasing their net revenues um, by more than 20%. Like just 1% of that untapped market, which Progenity would be the first one to enter, just 1% of that would give them huge huge profits to add to their balance sheet. And given that they already have the preclinical data and they're just holding on to it for an announcement for whatever reason, I'm assuming that they're trying to hold on to that data for um, their earnings report, which would be within uh, would be within their right to do, but they do have a deadline for late March. So they have to make that disclosure at some point. They can't just hang on to it forever that they have a fiduciary duty to disclose that preclinical data. All that being said, Progenity is uh, still, for me, a long-term play. I've got mostly leap options in Progenity. I do have some more uh, call options for April, but for the most part, I'm holding on to a, uh, a four-digit block of shares that I've got uh, squirreled away in my account, and that's just how I'm playing it. Um, Y'all do what's right for you, obviously, but for me, Progenity is looking nice and strong. I'm pretty happy with uh, with the progress that we've made over the last several trading weeks. I know that everybody is super excited about a squeeze, but uh, right now I don't think that a squeeze is what's on the car uh, on the table anymore. The main thing that I'm looking for Progenity to do is to be reevaluated and for its valuation to increase once they enter into this new market. That may, will probably take time, but um, you know, just don't be upset if Progenity doesn't make its huge moves right away. It's slowly inching its way upwards. And I have a feeling that once the actual news breaks, that Progenity will return to a reasonable valuation where it should be trading at. If I go ahead and bring over my Ortex. 
So there is one thing that I wanted to point out with Ortex and is that there is still a huge amount of short interest though. So just because I say that I don't think that a short squeeze is necessarily on the table doesn't mean that it's not possible or that I couldn't be wrong because there is still a lot of short interest overall. I do want to compare two figures to, for everybody. So there's, there's two things here. Um, the green, uh, the green line bar is uh, estimated short interest in the form of shares. So this is net shares short. And then the orange one is uh, short interest percentage of the free float, which is a ratio of shares divided by the float. And if you remember, there were several dilutions that occurred in progenity. So a lot of figures focus on short interest of the free float. And it's important to recognize that most of those shares were sold short uh, while progenity was trading sub uh, sub two dollars. A lot of these shorts have been in their positions ongoing since um, since before October. There's been a long term um, there's been a long term increase in shorts, uh, but there's also been a repeated increase very recently in the amount of shares that are on the float, and that's because of the I think I'm counting three now dilution events between the uh, at the at the market sale of shares, the uh, convertible notes, and warrants that were issued. So between all of those events, Progenity's float has increased almost th threefold. I want to say um, it, it, it's been a it's been a huge uh, repeat of AMC's story where continuous new dilution as the company is trying to swallow up as much cash as it can from investors in order to keep itself alive. Progenity itself is doing very well financially now. They have a much better balance sheet. Um, I'm frustrated that they chose to do it all at once and diluted the absolute hell out of the company, but they did it at a time that was best for them. And ultimately, it's going to keep this company well flush with cash for the next two years. That being said, the short interest itself is still quite high. So just because I say that there's not uh, that the short squeeze is not necessarily the play here doesn't mean that there isn't the possibility of it. See, a lot of shorts actually still haven't gotten out of their positions even after all of this. There's a lot of them added to their position after the um, a after this short squeeze occurred back here in mid-November, and a lot of them exited their positions on the way back down. There was a whole bunch that added to their position especially after we cracked above four dollars they really considered progenity to be overvalued and then they threw the stock down from its lofty heights and once they did succeed in doing that they covered most of those shares overall we started the entire uh, month of september with less than six million shares uh shorted at the top of the uh, at the top of progenity's price which is the highest point of short interest there was 24 million shares short. After all of that and uh, seeing us come back down, we're still at a short interest of roughly 12 and a half million. So there's still a lot of shares that are sold short in on Progenity right now. And I'll, I have a suspicion that just based on the average, which you can see here, is a lot of these guys have been in their positions for well over a month. But the thing to take away here is that there's still a net increase of shorts that has brought up the total number of short shares much higher than we were uh, than we were at before Progenity made its uh, biggest moves. Also considering that the utilization is now maxed out at 99% we can expect the cost of borrow to start rising but in any case the utilization is maxed out now at above 99.9% .9%, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult to find shares to sell short against Progenity and at that point without any more additional ammunition to start piling onto the stock. They'll either have to get those borrows from other firms which are long on the uh, long on progenity stock or uh, or they'll have to uh, continue naked shorting it if there is naked shorting going on in the stock. Just judging by the amount of failures to deliver at some point I feel like there was. So one more thing that I'll point out on Progenity is where we started with our uh, Fibonacci timeline and the Fib levels, which is basically what Progenity is respecting. So it bounced off of this bottom here, and that established our new low for our Fibonacci uh, extension, which you see here. We're starting from the low point here in uh, early August, or we could actually move it to about yay, since that's where we're starting our Fibonacci timeline.
the FIB levels for Progenity um, have been pretty well respected since we started trading this thing in early September, and the timelines have worked out quite well also. So the very first timeline that we have set is from this low to high back in early, uh, late August, early September. And from that point forward, Progenity, it took three more timeline periods before it started to make its moves upward. There was a two time frame series of uh, bullishness, and then we had a brief period of bullishness when we finished off the squeeze, and then it collapsed down from there. I'm expecting for there to be an additional uh, two periods of bullishness. Uh, this is basically one bearish period, and this would be one of consolidation. So I'm expecting that as we approach this earnings date, things start turning around for us. So since we bounced off this bottom, this is where we have our bottom of our FIB level set, and this is the first major line of resistance back up here at 235. Now what I'm watching for is for Progenity to start uh, turning the corner and respecting or continuing to respect this trend line here. And as long as it continues to do that, then I see no reason for uh, to believe that Progenity will collapse uh, back to its previous low point. And we have some big expectations for the earnings date coming up here soon. Until then, there's really not much to talk about with Progenity, unfortunately. Like, we're still waiting on preclinical trial data and for the uh, new trial data to uh, the new trials on their drug delivery system and their oral biotherapeutics delivery system to come through. And then once that data is processed and released, I have uh, I have very little doubt that there will be additional speculation drawn as to who their partners will be between the adalimumab and tofacitinib. Those two drugs are uh, excellent candidates for the oral biotherapeutics delivery system. And once that system is uh, accepted, for use with those drugs, and as soon as the preclinical trial data proves the uh, efficacy of those delivery systems and their um, both their effectiveness and the uh, reduction of side effects from those drugs by the method of delivery that those systems use, then I have little doubt that there will be licensing and partnerships drawn up between all the individual parties of those uh, uh, of those companies with Progenity to start using their drug delivery system for those drugs. So next on our list is BBIG, that's Vinco Ventures Incorporated. The uh, biggest trend that we have been watching is the uh, is the bounce ever since we hit this bottom. BBIG has been in a long downtrend ever since roughly was, uh, September 8th. So at the top of a, uh, a very, uh, very brief short squeeze, the company took a nosedive um, thanks to a really incompetent executive team that's just been disappointing us repeatedly with a lot of empty promises. Thankfully, they got a uh, they got an excellent CFO on their team by the name of Lisa King, who's really turned things around and started getting all their filings in order. Uh, since Lisa King came in and started uh, started showing up all the boys uh, how to do business, things have started to take a turnaround. There's been a, a, a big push up to the next level of resistance way up here at 553 at the top. <clears throat> the level of resistance that we actually broke through was at roughly uh, 476. So that was set here by this area of consolidation before we entered another downtrend. So since that rip, we've consolidated and it's been a rising consolidation, which is a bullish signal that there is positive sentiment in the stock, and the moving average shows us uh, heading up towards uh, 420. And all we need to do is just get above this resistance, just crack above it one more time. We tested it one, two, three, four times. We broke through it once already, and we've been trading below it since uh, since we came back down from five uh, from those. Uh, the high five dollar side. So if we can just see a little bit more, uh, a little bit more volume coming into the stock, if we can uh, get a little bit more news from the uh, cryptide release, it's possible that it may be priced in, but I don't think that it is. There's honestly not enough attention on the stock uh, from retail to justify the price right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Ortex data. So first, we'll take a look at the estimated short interest percentage of the free float. You can see that we steadily rose uh, multiple times, and then 
every time we had a dilution, this ratio sharply fell. That's because we increased our float. So every time that BBIG sold additional stock into the market, the price and the uh, short interest of free over the free float slightly took a dip. The uh, overall trend, though, has been the consistent rise of shares sold short into the market. So this is what we want to be paying attention to is just the estimated short interest based on the number of shares. Even even the even after all of these dilutions, the short interest of free float has been so staggeringly high. And it's just incredible that there's so many dollars betting against this stock right now when it's about ready to release a, uh, a new spinoff company with dividends paid out directly to shareholders and a, uh, a releasing a new competition or having acquired new competition to TikTok, which has already shown that they are taking share of that market on social media. And additionally, with the seeming the, the seemingly imminent demise of Facebook, there's an opportunity here for BBIG to capture additional uh, customers that are leaving those platforms. Utilization is completely maxed out here, and the short interest continues to rise consistently. Additionally, the failures to deliver data, which has been unbelievable this is most likely due to all of these options that had expired in the money from january the 14th notice that two trading days later is when the um, actual spike started to occur and the failures to deliver began to pile up this was a huge sign that the stock was being bet against in the form of short calls or calls sold into the market and when the price started to skyrocket after the bullish news of the uh, cryptide announcement they just weren't ready for it. So all of those calls that had expired in the money were forced to be delivered and eventually somebody had to purchase those shares out of the market. What I suspect may have happened is that market makers stepped in and balanced out everything by pushing the price down, shorting the market, filling buy orders with borrowed shares and filling those options deliveries with borrowed shares. The result of this was a huge rapid increase in utilization. So notice that shortly after these failures to deliver had oh, one second. So notice that shortly after the um, shortly after these failures to deliver had peaked, notice that the uh, short interest rapidly rose, just a sudden shoot up from 31.9 million all the way up to 36 and a half million shares sold short into the market. I have my suspicions that this market data was delayed, um, but it is an indicator that we're, there was additional borrowing. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to figure out who is who is shorting BBIG, why are they shorting BBIG, and why are they being forced to borrow shares in order to cover these failures to deliver, or are they even doing that? Yeah, so after after the failures to deliver disappeared, all of these shares that were on loan and the price was uh, already tanked back down to uh, a low of $3.04. That's when all of these shares were suddenly returned. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of these failures to deliver and the uh, trend with the shares on loan suddenly rising and dipping in six day increments is not a coincidence remember with the short exempt squeeze signal theory that i discussed uh, quite a bit there's a t plus six settlement time frame that uh, market makers are beholden to in order to close failures to deliver so when a market maker uses a short exempt to take a buy order and fulfill their duty as a quote bona fide market maker there is a two-day settlement period for that um, the expected share to be purchased and delivered to the person that bought that share that the market maker used the short exempt in order to fulfill that order. They get two days for that share to settle. If they don't, then it becomes a failure to deliver. And what I've seen is that every six trading days after that, which this is mentioned in the reg show filings, on that T plus six date, that's when the actual failure to deliver becomes a serious issue for the market maker and they start to get penalized for it. And that's when they start getting fined. If that 
becomes an excessive amount, then FINRA steps in or the SEC may have to step in. So in order to divert that uh, that negative attention, we'll say, they have to go, what they do is they end up borrowing shares out of the float as much as they possibly can. They cover those shares that were short exempted, and then they further short the stock and continue to do so until they can get the price pushed down to a place where it's far below where they took all of those short exempts. They buy them out of the market very slowly in order to not have an effect on the price, or they'll purchase a bunch of call options that are deep in the money. So as they are paying uh, for a option that has a delta of 1 or 0.99, that's almost perfectly matched with the price as if they had bought that security out of the market as shares. So what they do is they find options that are deep in the money, near expiration, they buy them all up, and they exercise them to acquire a huge load of shares that they then add to their inventory and they cover for a drastically discounted price from where they had shorted it at. And then they're able to profit off of that difference. And what I what I have theorized is that market makers have discovered that if they can use their short exempt, which is something that only they have access to. If they have that status and they can use short exempts to push the price down far enough and they can delay delivering them for as long as possible, as long as they just take all these short exempts, slam the price and uh, inflate the supply of that security enough while also keeping all of the buys restricted to their internalizers and keeping it off of the exchanges, they're able to suppress the price, push it down, and keep it there just by borrowing more shares, finding more borrowers, and continuously using short exempts in order to delay things by a six to eight day period. And they repeat this process until they get the price down to something that is acceptable to them, and then they cover everything all at once with those deep in the money options. This is just a theory that I have going on, but I suspect this is what's going on with BBIG. I will say this again. The only way, the only way that we achieve accurate and legitimate price discovery is to get off of payment for order flow brokers because payment for order flow brokers are all sending your orders to market makers, Virtu, Citadel, and UBS. If we allow that to continue to go on, then there is no way that there will ever be an accurate pricing of these stocks. They won't let it happen. They are not incentivized to allow the price to move beyond their control. The only way that we guarantee that our purchases are visible to the exchange and to the broader market to discover what the actual supply and demand is, is to purchase from the exchanges with market-directed orders. That is the key to absolutely everything with all of these different squeeze stocks. I have to put a disclaimer here that I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not an expert in market mechanics, but I do fundamentally feel that I understand enough about what has been happening after researching all of the filings, after interpreting them and getting verification from actual experts in the market and getting their take on things and having enough of them agree with me that I feel confident in my statements and my understanding of what these factors mean. So what we're looking at here is uh, short ex- uh, short volume data from uh, our Scourge Analytics bot. This is a beta bot that Hell's Trading Floor is building and testing currently uh, for kind of analyzing things like options, uh, options interest and volume. Um, And uh, right here in particular, we're looking at shorts uh, and short exempt volume. So since we think that a market maker is the one who's uh, playing around with this thing and uh, ripping us around by our our caller, I think it pays to uh, take a look at some of the history in BBIG's chart. So Looking at BBIG from the 1st of August all the way to the 26th of August. Now, this was the entire month leading up to BBIG's squeeze. And the price was being so, 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 so punished. There was a constant drag in the price where the uh, five-day simple moving average was moving down steadily at roughly uh, two to uh, between one and two percent. Up until we suddenly had a short turnaround uh, right around the um, 
uh, right around the uh, 13th, and then it started to turn green a little bit. The price started to lift again here uh, in uh, mid-August. And then it got shoved down again. And notice, notice the short exempts as they continue to climb. There was this constant climb in short exempts. And also note the failures to deliver. So every couple of days, when there was a huge spike in short exempts, two days later, there was a huge spike in FTDs. Isn't that interesting? And like I said with my theory, the short exempts, what they mean is that the market maker is taking a short without uh, locating a borrow, or they are shorting during a uh, during a downtick while the stock is on SSR. But if the stock is on SSR, then they can still be exempted from the locate rule because they have to short during a downtick. So they can use a short exempt and they can use that as an excuse to do so. Or just if the stock is being super volatile, they can use a short exempt and they say, we can't locate a share fast enough. We have to do a short exempt. We'll find it later. Two days later, they don't deliver it, okay? And then it becomes a failure to deliver. And if it continues to be a failure to deliver for the next six trading days, then, well, bad things happen to the market maker. What those things are, I don't have any idea because FINRA and the SEC won't get off their goddamn asses, but whatever. Let's just assume that they're doing their jobs. It would be nice for that to actually be happening, but let's assume for the sake of this argument that every time that the short exempts spike significantly. So short exempt volume is what we're looking here. Um, every time there's a big spike, two days later, FTD spike. <clears throat> so in addition to this, we can see that there's a, uh, there, there's a ratio here, the uh, short exempt volume divided by the short volume. That's how we get this number. Whenever we see the short exempt ratio rising above 3% uh, or staying above there consistently, um, or if we see a massive spike, such as if it goes, in this case, above 6.28%. This, this is a massive spike in short exempts compared to the overall volume, meaning that the volume has dropped out, but the, there's more short exempts being used to suppress the price. And then a couple of days later, there's even more failures to deliver. What a surprise. And all of a sudden, we started moving into this uptrend where the price was rising steadily from 223 all the way up to $3. And then we had one final day where just a massive, a massive trickle of volume. Well, it's cut off here, but the 26, and I can just show you this on TradingView, that would have been here. So the very next day, after all of those short exempts failed to deliver, is when the spike occurred. And then it continued on from there throughout the uh, rest of the next trading week. And interestingly enough, the 27th of August, the day that this made its huge move, there was a ton of options that were on the chain that expired in the money because of this move something that market makers were absolutely totally unready for, and so was everybody else who had sold naked call options that they fully expected were going to burn below $3.5, when all of a sudden, everything between there and all the way up to 5 and, let's see, what was the close? $5, everything above $5 closed in the money. That's a bad day to be a market maker, and that's a bad day to be short on BBIG. What followed after that was a huge amount of options running in the money, everybody had to scramble to deliver, and you know the rest of the story. BBIG sold off from that point, and it's been in consolidation ever since about the 1st of December. So let's compare what we're seeing here to what we are, uh, what we saw back in August to what we're seeing now. So this is just the last couple of trading weeks. We've had huge spikes repeatedly on BBIG, where the stock has been going green, causing options to go in the money, and it's been putting additional pressure on everybody who's been short on BBIG. And every time that the price gets a little bit too uncomfortable, the following day, there's a huge amount of short exempts that keep getting pushing it down. Now, if BBIG resists this pushback, this bearish, uh, this bearish pressure, and the stock continues to rise and what we'll, what we'll see is the five-day SMA and the five-day SMA delta rate, that's the rate of change in the five-day SMA, continues to rise. Uh, what we really like to look for is for it to be going at about 5% per day or 
for the price to be uh, for the average price to be rising five percent per day for several days in a row, or if we can just get one good solid spike in the price right before options expiration would also be um, an excellent excellent change of momentum. What happened the previous trading day was we had a huge amount of short exempt volume and very little volume by comparison, so much so that the short exempt volume was 2% of the short volume and it was 1.2% of the total volume, which is a huge discrepancy. There's no reason for there to be so many short exempts. And this is why I keep saying purchasing on the exchange and purchasing shares puts an immense amount of pressure. Um, I believe it was Matt Kors that made this analogy that if you imagine uh, the share price as being a uh, lit match, options are like gasoline. The options by themselves don't move the price, but if you can put enough pressure to get that match to move a little closer to the gas, you can light it. And once the options that go in the money set off the whole chain, and it can push the price a phenomenal amount. We're seeing a ton of pressure from the bears trying to keep BBIG down. And as long as they can't drop it below this next strike, then they won't be able to control it anymore. They're trying desperately to keep it below $3 right now. And let's see if we can explain the reasons why. This is a little bit too messy. Ah, yes, here we go. This is the chart. So additional data that our, uh, our lovely scourge bot has provided to us is just how serious these guys are about keeping the price below two dollars right now the market price uh, at the time that this was analyzed was three dollars and 23 cents there's a lot of options that are going to expire uh, out of the money this week but March is extremely heavy so heavy in fact that if the price were to rise just to a little over four and a half dollars that more than 14% of the free float would be in the money. That can cause a supply crisis, especially when you consider that most of the float is held by small institutions that are not forced to report. These are a huge number of options, so much that I don't actually think that they're all covered for. So if we have a situation where BBIG can actually start to attack these prices before March 25th, um, most of these are actually on March 20, uh, March 18th. So if before March 18th, if we can see BBIG's price pushing 450, then there is absolutely an opportunity here for a gamma squeeze. Next up is DKNG, which unfortunately has not worked out for us the way that we expected it to. This Friday was a uh, was a tremendous disappointment. The thing that upsets me about it is that the earnings were phenomenal. DraftKings did better than anybody expected them to. They beat their earnings in basically every uh, in every category, and they still got the rug pulled out from under them. I have no doubt that this was just purely for the purpose of getting all of those options to expire out the money. It's been frustrating, to say the least. Um, watching this happen and knowing knowing just how bullish all of the options flow was and how many, how many shares were being purchased uh, ahead of their earnings, just to see it get rug pulled the morning of after such an amazing earnings beat makes absolutely no sense. And of course, mainstream media is going to point out like one bad thing, like this is the whole reason why they sold off. It's complete bullshit, but whatever. They'll make whatever argument they need to justify their reporting in order to say like, oh, no, we weren't wrong. We just found that DKNG wasn't upfront or wasn't forthcoming about their numbers or whatever it is that they want to say about it. Ultimately, DKNG got rug pulled and it was just to put the options out the money. This was a huge options expiration week for DKNG and they shoved it back down uh, into this technical bull channel or almost did. Um, we may see a technical bounce coming the next week, but um, that's uh, that's entirely up to uh, the dealer's choice at this point if anyone wants to continue playing DKNG. Um, I think it's a good company, honestly. Like, I don't have anything against sports betting. There's nothing, I don't have anything against gambling. I mean, what else are we doing here, honestly, playing the stock market? No matter how you look at it, it doesn't matter how good you are at it. It doesn't matter how knowledgeable or how much research you can do. It's still a gamble, as evidenced by this situation right here, because 
the company can be doing great. It can be fantastic. It can be super profitable. And somebody can rip the rug out from under retail anyway. I would love to see what exactly the justification was for selling all of these shares and who the hell did it. But whatever. We're never going to know, are we? Unfortunately, uh, this is going to wash me out of most of my options for DKNG, so a lot of my uh, a lot of my calls are going to expire worthless on this. Um, that's just the way it is. This is BKKT, which is a very similar story. We were forming a perfect cup and handle, and we even had completed the handle. And just as we were getting ready to make another rip up towards its uh, high, uh, its next level of resistance at uh, $9, immediately huge, overwhelming bearish pressure on BKKT, absolutely out of nowhere. It's pushed us out of our technical pattern, so I'm not sure exactly where the uh, bottom is right now. We're currently sitting at support based on, uh, based on the mid of the cup that we had set here. So this is currently where our support is at. If we break down below through this, then it's likely that we may see the bottom here at 535. So it's not it, it it's not exciting to have to report this, but I always promise you guys that I don't bullshit you. However, I'm still playing BKKT. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've been uh, day trading options in this. Most of my long position is set out for April and May. Currently, uh, BKKT is still in good shape. The Bitcoin, the fall of the Bitcoin price over the last couple of days may have helped push this down a little bit, but that also has to do with uh, Russia just continuously poking the bear that is Ukraine and uh, trying to get, I don't know, I don't know if they're just trolling NATO or if they're just, if Putin's just having fun or if he has some ulterior motive for this, whatever the Whatever the case may be, the overall trend in the market is just going to be dependent on what happens with the Ukraine right now. And until we get some reasonable conclusion, uh, whether we're going to <laughs> end up going to war or not, is, uh, is going to likely decide where we move from here. Uh, and that, that is true for just about the entire market, not just BKKT. However, with uh, BKKT in particular, I, uh, I do see... The potential for some serious upside if we can uh, break out of this uh, this downtrend here and bounce get a technical bounce off of the uh, level that we're currently trading at. If we bounce off of 5:30, then I'm looking for BKKT to make another run back to eight dollars here in the next couple of trading weeks. I do have uh, I do have a great deal of calls that are still. sitting at what was that expiration you know just giving everybody full disclosure of what i see here ah uh, yes bkkt most of my calls are set up for so march 18th and a few more for april um bkkt is also showing several uh several bullish signs especially on our uh, scourge bot we've got uh multiple signals of short exempts spiking and uh it was going pretty well throughout this entire period but of course as we approach expiration friday when there was a huge opportunity for there to be some gamma momentum the rug got pulled so oh wow what a surprise all the same the obv is still uh, is still tracking with the price right now so this is unfortunately um this is unfortunately some rather serious bear pressure and I think that this has everything to do with the total market sell-off. I don't think that they could have pushed this down without some help from Putin's just screwing with the market. That being said, if we can get a peaceful conclusion to everything that's going on over uh, over in Russia and Ukraine, then there's a very good chance that it will bring a whole bunch of bullish momentum back into the stock. The Bitcoin price will go bananas like it usually does. And... Uh, everything will be back to normal as always, and you know. But we just have to be really patient and cautious uh, as we continue to play these stocks because it's going to be dependent on whatever the world leaders and the lunatics that run their respective dictatorships decide to do tomorrow. 
So just looking one more time at BKKT on the 30 minute chart, just to uh, get a closer look at what's going on here. As you can see, we do have a technical bounce starting to develop itself here on the 30 minute off of this, uh, this uh, 530 level. This is uh, pretty much exactly where I expected a bounce to occur if it was going to happen today, then uh, it, it's it's looking like we might be in good shape. If we complete the bounce and we start heading up above 630, then I uh, expect us to test resistance next week at above uh, a, at $8 again. If we can break that, then that will be the one two third test of $8. And if we can break through eight dollars, then it's likely we'll see nine and possibly even ten. But what we need to do is get back up into this uh, ascending level of support. Since we broke this channel, though, it's not really uh, it really doesn't hold any power anymore. So now we have to reset our expectations. So we got a widening channel. So if we can get a nice bounce up here, then we'll see what happens if we might retest this level here in the next uh, in the next few days. So BKKT's uh, short data is showing a lot of mm, sketchiness, I want to call it. So they they were steadily moving well above uh, eight dollars for a while, and the five day SMA was tracking up towards uh, $8. This was the most bullishness that we had seen, and I think that this may actually be a sign that control has been totally lost on BKKT. So there is negative pressure right now in the next in over these next couple of days, but I think that next week, if we see some turnaround, might actually signal um, the uh, manifestation of a possible short squeeze. Reason why I say that is because of all all this red that you see here on the short volume and short exempt volume indicates some massive spikes. And the fact that there have been a huge amount of spikes recently in BKKT is an indicator that market makers are desperately trying to control the price right now. They're trying to fulfill buy orders and there's too many of them coming in now that they are just not able to keep tight control over that price. And since the price has been steadily rising, at least up until the last few trading days, the five-day SMA is well, well above its previous highs. So BKKT, uh, what I'm watching for is for the short exempt ratio to maintain its current position at around 3%. Um, these signals here are already a huge buy signal for me. If we take a look at the Ortex data, so BKKT, 45% of the stock, short. Uh, that's just 45% of the free float. Let's actually take a look at the estimated short interest. Look at that spike. Look at how massive this is. There's a tremendous amount of bearish pressure coming in on this stock, and the utilization is 100%. Let's actually take a look at how utilized this stock has been. Oh, dearie, dearie me. The utilization has been above 90% for the last several trading weeks. As a matter of fact, it's been that way since, when was this? January 13th. So ever since January 13th, the utilization has been above 90%, and it's maxed out the last several trading weeks as more and more and more borrowers have been pouring their cash into the stock. This is not just, this is not just regular bearishness trying to capitalize on a downtrend. This is also market makers trying to keep control of the price because these options cannot expire in the money. There's a ton of options that are currently on uh, on the chain right now for this expiration Friday, but I promise you that after this expiration Friday completes, there will be a changeover. People will be pushing out their options to the next expiration weeks to follow. With the cost of borrow steadily rising past 23%, and also just the amount of short interest here coming into the stock, there's it, they're trying really hard to push down the price, and maybe they'll succeed, right? But if they don't, if they don't, if retail catches wind of this, and we can see like maybe another 20 million shares pushing up against this, uh, pushing up against this bearish pressure, just pure buying of shares. I don't think that they'd be able to cover all of it. Like, I just, I, I don't. I, I'm putting on my tinfoil hat very briefly here, but uh, let's actually analyze some of this, uh, some of this short data. 
short interest has been rising ever since the BKKT price was around $7.50. That's what this open was, and it closed at $6.19. So this is where the rise began. Notice our utilization, well above 90% for a significant period of time. Here's the days on loan. Yeah, this would be the day. So their average price of entry, just based on the average days on loan for the oldest shorts, would be somewhere in the range of 361 and 414 I'm going to estimate about three and a half dollars. So above seven dollars, they're well underwater. That's a 100% loss. If we could get back above seven dollars here in the short term, then I think that would put enough pressure to entice them to start thinking about covering. Oh, look at that. I didn't even realize it entered onto the threshold list. That means that the failures to deliver are right back up in this range. So if you have to imagine BKKT's failures to deliver, then they must still be above $3 million. It doesn't even necessarily have to be that much. It could be anywhere as low as $1 million. Excuse me. <clears throat> could be as low as $1 million. So now that BKKT is uh, just wholesale failing to deliver over the last what's this, five trading days, this would have been the first day. So these started failing to deliver on the 7th of February, and as soon as the price went to a high of $6.21 and closed above five eighty, So we don't even have to stay that high. We just have to stay above five eighty for a significant period of time. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm seeing it now. All right, BKKT is some serious pressure. They're trying to get these options to expire out the money for this Friday, but I think that if the uh, if, if this follows through, if the if the bulls if the bulls take back control and get this thing to bounce before um, uh, before the close of next week, then this play is still very much in the running for a huge squeeze. Hmm. These short exempts are massive, and the failures to deliver have to be over a million for it to be on the threshold security list for the last five trading days. Given what we figured out with the average uh, average days on loan and the price of where BKKT was trading at, we're estimating that shorts have uh, been underwater ever since about five and a half dollars. And as long as the price stays above that level, um, these failures to deliver will continue to mount up. Right now, just based on where the failures to deliver were when BKKT got onto the threshold security list, we estimate that the failures to deliver have to be at least 1 million shares failed to deliver or more for the last five trading days. As long as the price keeps moving against them and as long as it can hover above that five and a half, six dollar range for a lengthy period of time that doesn't give shorts enough time to cover, then BKKT can absolutely squeeze. There's a huge amount of shares sold short on this stock right now. 44 percent of the stock is short. That's just ridiculous. The options are kind of secondary at the moment. There's not a whole lot of open interest in the near term after this uh, after this Friday. What I'd be looking for is March 18th and the quarterlies for April. So there's quite a bit of open interest here on the call side for March 18th and then additional ones for April would be the uh, next uh, the next month after that uh, for monthly options expiration. One last thing that I'll point out on BKKT is just what happened before it squeezed the last time, a long descending channel. It's kind of a, uh, it kind of borders on hopium, but at the same time, uh, every time that there's been a short squeeze, there's always that push, you know, there's always that bearish push to try to shove the price down below. Everybody who's doubling down on their position, just trying to bet against it. And I have a feeling that BKKT's momentum, they they're likely going to run out of steam. They've been at 100% utilization for well over three trading weeks now. And what happened here just before it squeezed is happening again here. This is just my opinion, and this is not financial advice, but the way I see it, if retail steps in here and if the price hovers above 550 before the end of next uh, expiration Friday, then I have a feeling that BKKT can have a huge turnaround. The OBV is signaling hellish divergence, the short exempts are through the roof, and there's just a lack of control in the stock price. 
Uh, I, I feel like this is the last major push that they had in them before they can have to let off the pressure in order to let the stock run. So I'm going to continue to hold on to my bets for BKKT. I'm holding on to positions for March 18th and for April uh, April 20th, I believe it is. In any case, that's it for the video, guys. Thanks for tuning in to get this uh, quick update on all of our squeeze picks. And uh, have a hell of a weekend.